I'm Sarah Holland, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Sarah Holland. I'd like to thank a few sponsors before we get into today's show because it's those sponsors that allow us to keep bringing you shows day after day. The Son of Earp series by Chuck Buddha, Shifters, Ghosts, and Demons, all set within the backdrop of the Old West. James Johnson, illegitimate son of the legendary Wyatt Earp, dreams of adventure and following in his daddy's footsteps. His mentally disabled friend Carson stands by his side. Together, the friends wage war against evil. The Son of Herb series has it all. Supernatural forces are at work and the body count is rising. Can James and Carson save their cursed friend? Will they defeat the haunted gunslinger before more innocents die? Can James and Carson defeat the possessed before the demon hits the Chisholm Trail? Or will the devil win the West? Curse of the Ancients, Haunted Gunslinger, Summoner of Souls. The Son of Herb series is available in paperback, ebook, and audio formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Pick it up from Juck Buddha today. There's a link in the show notes. Mad Jones, Heretic by Quinn Hillier. Mad Jones, Heretic delivers sharp satire on modern religion, politics, and media all at the same time, along with insightful representations of the vagaries of today's celebrity culture and the lunacy of internet comment threads. Controversies surrounding race and sexual morality enter in as well. Additionally, its setting at the end of the 20th century in the midst of the Y2K computer scare provides the perfect vehicle to dissect millennialist themes as well. Matt Jones Heretic by Quinn Hillier. And Craig Martell and Scott Moon's brand new kickoff to their uh, Dark Landing series. The first book is called Assignment Dark Landing. A frontier world, one sheriff, and all the action one spaceport can handle. Dark Landing is the wild, wild west of known space. Sheriff Thaddeus Fry will never completely leave the battlefields of Centauri Prime. His new assignment, the Sheriff's Office of Dark Landing, could be a do-nothing job or it could get him killed. The first thing he learns is that his predecessor's headquarters were bombed, creating the vacancy that led to his appointment. The company man is not who he expected, to say the least. His new accommodations are right in the center of Dark Landing's misfits. He finds one native willing to talk to him and tries to make him a deputy. What really matters in Dark Landing are the mines. Faced with a dangerous collapse that could kill hundreds of workers, he leaps into action and gets the story of Dark Landing started. Fans of Firefly, Bonanza, and Tombstone will love the new series. It's going to be releasing every 18 days, so uh, go pick up a, a copy of Dark Landing the, uh, as the series kicks off and watch for it. Uh, Scott and Craig were on the show right before Christmas, so go back and listen to that episode and get a, uh, a full, deep understanding of everything that you're doing. Uh, thank you for listening. As always, uh, stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Now on to our interview. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Sarah Holland on the show with me. She has a brand new book out. It's been out just a couple of weeks now. It's called Everless, and it is a really uh, unique spin and take on uh, kind of a fairy tale revival. And uh, I think you guys are really going to love this book, uh, but it's called Everless. And uh, Sarah Holland, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm glad to have you. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? A writer or storyteller? I'm also kind of losing my voice, so just to warn you. Um, I think it's a it's a bug going around. Don't, don't feel yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, well, there wasn't really one aha moment, I guess, growing up. I, I came from a very story-oriented family, um, so there was always tons and tons of books around and, and storytelling in general. Um, one of one of my earliest memories of anything is, um, so I'm the oldest of four siblings, and we in our house there was 
three three bedrooms in, in one hall and we were each in one. And my dad would sit in the hall, like in between equidistant from the bedrooms and tell stories um, at, um, you know, before bed at night. Um, so between that and, and the books just in, in every room, along every wall, um, stories were always a part of my life. And um, I, so I had that. And then when I was a kid in elementary school and there were, our teachers would do this thing where you could write, quote unquote, write a little book and illustrate it. And then they would like laminate it and bind it up for you, which was just the most exciting thing for me. Um, so <laughs> they created a monster there, but those are probably the two early formative experiences. You know, I've, I've talked to, um, uh, to a lot of writers, uh, over 300 episodes and, uh, there is, a. Uh, there's a, a crazy amount of writers who have the same memory of being like an elementary school and a teacher or sometimes a parent, um, you know, helps them create a book, you know, with the cover and the, you know, the lamination and, mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing. And that, that memory sticks out with so many people. Um, you know, there's this crazy thing when, when you're little, you just kind of think that books just kind of magically appear. Right. Uh, but there, there's something about actually creating one. And then uh, it, it, it kind of takes that barrier down in our minds. I think, you know, that, that, uh, the books might be magical, uh, but they're created by a person. And even that small act of putting that little story together there, um, I think gives people a lot of confidence to, to think that they can go on and do that for real. Yeah, I think that's definitely so true. I don't, I don't know when the sort of custom began in schools, but, um, it definitely was a light bulb moment that was for me that was like, Oh wow. Like this is a, you know, this is a story just like the ones that you tell out loud, but that's how books happen. Right. Um, I'll, I'll say your dad being a storyteller and, and, and telling you kids stories. I, I absolutely love that. Um, was, uh, what, were your parents big readers and, and did they kind of surround you guys with books? Yeah. So we had, um, tons of books in the house. Um, just of all genres, there was a lot of, um, kids books and picture books obviously with the four of us and um then sort of just you know a lot of my dad likes military thrillers um so there was a lot of you know tom clancy and vince flynn and that kind of thing um so not super appropriate but i i definitely picked up those um at a perhaps too early age um we we were very into the harry potter series as a family um and then just you know um like spoken spoken stories, I guess regular stories, non written stories. Um, wh where did you grow up? I grew up in a suburb of Minneapolis. Okay, so so lots of winters with uh, uh, lots of indoors time, I would imagine. Definitely, yeah. So that might be part of it too. <laughs> Probably so. Um, yeah. So, what kind of books did you like, and what kind of stories really kind of captured your imagination? Um. Probably unsurprisingly, I read a lot of fantasy. Um, you'll get this from absolutely any author around my age, but Harry Potter was a huge touchstone. Um, just, you know, the vastness um, and the sort of accessibility of that world um, was just a really fun um, thing to have growing up. It was like the um, Harry, the protagonist, obviously like grew up along with the reader sort of. So it was this ongoing saga um, throughout my my childhood. I really love um, his Dark Materials, the um, Philip Pullman series, like his gold, the Golden Compass, etc. Um, I really liked Cassandra Clare's Shadowhunter books. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fantasy. Yeah, I, I've always I, been drawn to that. Yeah, a, a lot of writers, uh, you know, begin with fantasy, and uh, and then uh, the, I've talked to so many writers who write other genres um, other than fantasy, uh, but always kind of begin by writing a fantasy book. Like, there's something I, I I still haven't figured out what it is, but there's something about fantasy stories that just kind of capture all of our imaginations. Yeah, and uh, and and there's this need to tell these fantastical stories, even people that, uh, that go on to write, you know, military thrillers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, a lot of them have, have roots in fantasy. Uh, what do you think it is uh, for you? Obviously you can't speak for everybody, but, um, what do you think it is uh, for you that, uh, that, that endears you so much to fantasy stories? Yeah. Well, just a off the cuff hypothesis here. 
is I feel like, especially for kids' books, um, you're you're reading and you don't necessarily have a lot of um, power or agency in the world, like you, in, not in a bad way, but you just can't really determine what you do on a day to day basis. Um, and then in, for better or for worse in fantasy, uh, parents often uh, meet terrible ends, um, which is sad, but then gives the kids freedom to go off and have adventures. Um, and you obviously that can still happen in other genres, but you have to justify it a little bit more, I think. Uh, so I, th I think it sort of lends itself well as a genre to, um, to children's literature and children are in turn drawn to it because maybe it uh, lets us explore like those, that um, feeling of having choices um, and having more self-determination. I think that's a pretty good theory. I, I, I like that. A working theory, but <laughs> when when you um when you're in the high school and, and starting to think about uh kind of maybe what you want to do career wise, uh was was writer on your radar uh, or or were you thinking uh you know pursuing a different career and, and then you you wound up at writing? It was definitely on the radar, and and I was I was writing you know a little um I would always be starting some big ambitious project um. But, um, you know, you, if you're, um, if you're a teen and you're looking at the, um, you know, job options, it's not, it's not really portrayed as being a, a option that you can just go to college or, um, graduate from high school and just become an author. Um, and I, you know, I think that's a good thing because it's, it is a really um, difficult path, but, um, so I always wanted to sort of have an alternate plan. Um, so I went to school and I double majored, um, in English and then, um, my parents wanted me to do something practical. So I picked, uh, political science, which was actually not very practical at all, uh, but it sounded slightly better. Um, so I thought about, um, but, but it's good for writing, uh, uh like, um, you know, antagonist and, uh, yeah, and super villains. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, especially if you're, um, writing fantasy or anything where you have to world build it's good to have like an understanding of the the basic structure of of governments and societies i guess right. yeah um so that that i did some you know like nonprofit internships and whatnot um and that was an option but i actually ended up um getting a job in in publishing and then also writing Wow. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting that if, uh, if a kid wants to become an accountant, uh, there's a very clear career path to becoming an accountant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you go to school, you study accounting, uh, you know, you, you study for the CPA certification test, whatever that's called. Uh, you become a, a CPA, you, you go to work for a firm, you work your way up. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a very determined path. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, writer is, uh, is not a clear path at all. There are uh, many, many, many people who have no education in writing whatsoever that go on to, to be, Multi millions uh, of copy sellers, and then there are people that have MFAs, uh, and sometimes they find the same success, and sometimes they kind of, you know, wander in obscurity, and and no one ever reads anything they write, and uh, it's it's a, you know, the the artistic pursuits are are very kind of nebulous, and uh, I I like the idea of studying other things to to learn a little bit about the world and and maybe how things work and then reporting on the on those things in your writing. Yeah, I think it's always good to have some sort of outside um, you know, input in your life that's not just writing um because yeah, I think I I don't totally subscribe to the model that you need life experience to write, but I think you need something well, sure, sure. And I, I'm not saying that you have to wait until you're 50 to start writing. Of course not. Um, but, but it does help to know some things, you right, know, that, because yeah. those things inform the writing that you're yeah. going to do. You know, that's just, uh, it helps. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you said you went to work in publishing. What did, what did you do? Um, well, so I actually still do, um, but I work at a, at a literary agency. Nice. Um, I, I assist, um, two really amazing agents. Cool. Um, which which is super fun, and I enjoy that too. Yeah, um, I'm always fascinated to to talk to people who work uh, in publishing, especially before they uh, 
you know get published themselves uh because i i feel like that as a as a young writer you definitely have ideas about what uh, the writer life is going to be and and what the publishing experience is going to be mm-hmm. um when you sort of got into the industry there um did did your ideas change uh did you uh you know kind of realize okay i've got to become more savvy than than i thought i would uh, you know kind of, kind of what did did your rose colored glasses come off yeah, that's that's interesting. I feel like I somewhat knew what it was like going in. Um, I think maybe um, as actually in like my like writer hat, I had done a lot of research about about the whole publishing process, and it was something I was independently really interested in. Um, and I I was very intrigued by this idea of um, of helping other books come into existence. Um, and I always really loved like helping my friends and siblings with their school papers. Um, and, you know, we had a little writing club in high school um, where we would trade stories. Um, so I'd always um, also loved helping other people and interacting with other people's work. Um, so I had wanted to um, continue doing that in some capacity. And it seemed like um, something in publishing would be super helpful to like get some insight into this world um, and to be able to sort of get my hands, um, you know, in other people's work um, and, and make an impact there too. Yeah. I, you know, I don't think that could be stressed enough that uh, writing can be a very solitary pursuit, um, Mm -hmm. but helping other people on their journey um, is never a bad idea. You know, you know, if, whether it's just, you know, offering critiques to a friend uh, or if it's, you know, uh, helping someone with marketing or, or whatever you can do to help someone mm-hmm. else, um, you know, not only uh, is a good thing to do, uh, you know, but it, it, it th- those relationships are, are super important when you're yeah. dealing in a solitary pursuit, like writing and publishing. Yeah. Yeah. That they, the relationships are crucial um, because, you know, you can't just be sitting alone all day writing. Um, that would be sad. And then on a craft level, um, this is a little bit of a cliche, but I feel like I've really learned so much from um, even just um, even just the the essays, like the school essays that I've worked on with other people have um, trained me to be really sort of um, attentive to, you know, brevity and word choice and all that sort of nitty gritty stuff. Um, and I feel like it's translated. Well, yeah, and um, you know, uh, cliches are that way for a reason. You know, there, there's there's truth true. there, and uh, yeah, for sure. Um, what did uh, d- did you have a, a book in in progress when you went to work? Uh, you know, for the uh, for the literary agency. Yeah, I ha- I have sort of like a lot of projects that I I never finished anything. Um, I I had a few false starts um, for various um, fantasy novels. Um, but uh, the sort of seed of the idea for Everlist arrived shortly after I started there. Gotcha. Um, did uh, did the the folks that you worked with did they offer uh, you know input or, or any sort of you know writerly wisdom along the way? Yeah, uh, I, I definitely have have leaned on them really heavily for sort of like publishing advice in general and just reassurance like oh oh this thing happened it seems so terrible mostly ends up saying like oh this is fine this is normal don't worry about it which has honestly been so helpful you know I um I'm in um like virtual and and real writers groups um and I I definitely feel lucky that that I have people to talk to about this that that know that know a little bit about it um, and I'm not just sort of out there with my, by myself with my head down. <laughs> right. Um, so you said that you had started a lot of things, but you had never really stuck with it and finished the story all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think was the, the difference, uh, in Everless? Uh, and how do you think that you matured as a writer, uh, that allowed you to, to, to see this all the way through to the, to the end? Oh, that's a good question. I have not really thought too much about that, but um, I think maybe part of it was just um, it was it was the first time I was just out of college and I, I was building my own routine. Um, so I, I was busy, but I also 
was trying to write a little bit every day, um, which was weirdly easier when I when I had to build it into a solid routine. Um, and I, I had this sort of little network um, and was able to talk to other writers and publishing people for the first time. There, I mean, there were writers in high school and college, but um, not necessarily people who were who were thinking about it as like a career. So it was the first time I'd really met other people who who were interested in these same sorts of goals. Um, and then I just I think just sort of the feeling that like I'm here and it's time to go for it. Right. Gotcha. Where, where did the idea for Everless come from? Uh, where kind of uh, th- this is a, a really kind of a take on on some classic fairy tale type stories. Uh, it has that that sort of feel, but you know, there's a uh, there's a great maturing. Uh, there's, there's been several books out that last year, especially that that have this feeling and this tone. Uh, yeah, of things definitely. that we rem- remember from childhood, um, while not being that, uh, like it, it's it, to me, it's it's like a, a kind of a whole new emerging genre, and I love it. Um, but where did the the idea for this particular story and kind of how did it come to life for you? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good way of putting it—the sort of semi nostalgic fairy tale feeling. I, I can't quite put it into words, but I totally know what you mean, um, and I really like that feeling too. Um, so the the main conceit of Everless is that time is currency and it can be bought and sold um, and sort of hoarded or given away, et cetera. Um, and this obviously leads to all sorts of problems with inequality. And um, in the midst of that, the main character, Jules, uh, goes to work at this sort of palatial estate to save her father and prophecies and, and new friends, enemies, et cetera. So... It's sort of, there was a couple of different um, factors that that gave me the idea rather than one specific watershed moment, I think. Um, stories for me usually start with an image. Um, so I, I'd had this image of a girl who's, um, who's kneeling by the side of this icy lake um, and I knew that she had lost something and I knew that she was angry, but I didn't know why or how she'd gotten there. Um, so I was trying to excavate that. And then um, at the same time, I was I was like working and, you know, I had my, my side job at a coffee shop and I had to, to budget out my time really carefully. Um, so I would have this conversation with myself like, oh, like, you know, is, is such and such social activity worth the two hours that I would spend? So, um, it, which is a really s- strange and I think probably not very healthy way to think, but um, I like kept on thinking like, oh, if I could only magically get more time. So that that sort of thought process in combination with the, the image of the girl gradually sort of intertwined and gave rise to the story. Um, do you, did you, um, uh, how, how much planning went into this book before you started writing it? Um, did, did you have an idea where the story was going or did you just start writing and, and kind of discover, uh, the character and setting as you went? Mm-hmm. I'm a pretty, I usually outline a lot. Um, I, I do like to have that roadmap. Um, so I, I had probably a three to four page outline for the whole book. Um, and then Usually before I start a new chapter, I, I write just a little bullet point list of what needs to happen in that chapter. Gotcha. Um, so you, you had an idea of the whole story before you actually started writing it? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, how, how, what is your daily writing habit like? Um, and, and I know you talked about, you know, having to, to budget out time, you, you know, um, but do you try, do you sit down every day and try to write or do you, um, you know, some writers will kind of walk around for three or four days, kind of mm-hmm. mulling the story over in their head. Uh, and, and that is writing time as well. Um, yeah. you know, uh, but are you someone that has to sit down and, and type every day? Uh, or do you kind of take it in spurts? I, I try to do it every day um, with varying levels of success. Um, but yeah, I definitely do have that pre, like, pre-starting like pre a project time of it's just sort of percolating. 
um, where I, I won't necessarily put anything down on paper for, um, you know, even a few weeks after I first have an idea and I'll just sort of think about it. Um, then once I, once I actually started, I, I usually try to get up early in the morning um, and sit down for an hour um, or an hour and a half before work um, and sort of give that my, my fresh brain for the day. Uh, the idea of time as currency is is really unique. Um, you know, when when you see uh, kind of fantastical settings and magic systems and things like that, and, and you think that just about everything has been kind of explored. This is this is a really fresh um, idea. Uh, when you when you kind of came on this idea for that, was it a real aha moment? And did you know that you were onto something special? I I think I I did have a feeling that it was going to work out well. Um, because I think I, I accidentally stumbled on something sort of really simple, which I think is the key to a great, um, sort of conceit or magic system. Um, I think the best ones are ones that are, that are very easily graspable and easily described. Um, and then I think it, it also works a little bit because it sort of is a physical manifestation of what in my opinion, is already an abstract reality in our world. I mean, we have these sayings like time is money. Um, and um, in a lot of ways, um, you can like buy more time or um, even like the amount of wealth you have can affect your quality of life and the length of it. Um, and then just on on a level of like, if you have if you have ever had a wage job, like that's literally assigning a dollar value to your hours, like, you know, eight or 10 or $12. Um, so I think the concept works, um, if it does, because, you know, it's, it's taking sort of this condition that already exists and just making it really tangible. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty direct metaphor, but in, in a way that, uh, that is easily graspable. I, I think when, when you, uh, kind of translate it this way, it, it really opens your eyes to, to kind of some of the realities of the world. And I guess that's really what fantasy is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just reflecting the world, but at a different angle or, right. you know, through, right. through some sort of filter. Yeah. Um, is, is this a standalone book or, or will this be part of a series? Um, it's the first of a duology. So there will be um, one more sequel out nice. in 2019. Okay. Um, what was the, the publishing process like for you when, when you finished the manuscript? Uh, and, and well, first off, when you made it all the way through, um, that had to be a great feeling and, and you had to uh, kind of feel like you had something special there, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was um, it was a lot uh, faster writing than I'd ever done before. So that, too, was an indicator that, you know, maybe this was um, something special or something to look closely at. So, um it was a bit of an unusual um, publishing process because um, it had actually um, been sold on proposal. So once I was done, I, I did some edits myself, but then I sent it right off to um, HarperCollins um, because we already had a, a deal in place. So um, I tried to, to make it as good as I could by myself, and then I sent it to... Um, to my editor there. Um, and then from there, it pretty much proceeded as, as everyone's does. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really interesting because, uh, selling a, a novel on proposal doesn't happen very often. Yeah, it, it was definitely, um, lucky. Yeah. And, how, and, how, do, how does that process happen? How do you, how do you sell a novel on proposal? So, um, I was, I'd, I'd been in, in, talks for a long time with this um this company called glass entertainment and they're so they're a um packager so they sort of figure out concepts for stories and then match authors to them and then work to help the author um you know execute it and and turn that into a finished book so i'd i'd like submitted to them before um and we had had corresponded but nothing had worked out um, but we, we connected on this one and so, so there's an agent who represents Glattown and he sold it to, um, Harper Collins once I had written about a hundred pages. Um, 
And then I drafted the rest of it and, and did some editing um, with, with myself and with Glass Town. And then we sent it to Harper. How cool. Yeah. What, the, what an interesting concept. Um, it's, been, that, it's been really fun. Yeah. You know, um, publishing is changing so much. And uh, I, I think it's a really uh, it's a it's a great time for for people, and I'm, I'm not familiar with Glass Town, but we'll we'll definitely check it out. Yeah, they're um, for, a great team. Yeah, the, it's a, a a cool cool time and place for people to step in and and offer services like that. That because uh, uh, you know publishing is is changing almost daily. You know, it's it's becoming a uh, a, a very competitive place for sure to, to try to get shelf space and and to get the you know the, the word out about your books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as as a as a debut, I, you know, even even all these um, like amazing privileges I had, I still don't really know what I'm doing. So it's nice <laughs> to have some backup. Well, and being um, you know connected with the literary agency, I'm, I'm sure helps it, it, at least in the uh, the encouragement and you know uh, at least knowing uh, you know what's going to happen and, and right. not just running into it blind. Yeah, definitely. I, I felt like I I knew at least the process, even this. The particulars of it differ for everyone. I knew the general outlines of how it was supposed to go, which has been so helpful. All right, um, Sarah. The the new book is called Everless. It's uh, out now. Uh, it came out the first of January. Uh, a really unique fantasy story. I'm uh, recommending everyone go pick up a copy of it. Uh, if they are not familiar with you and your work, where can people find you online? Um, so I'm mostly on Twitter at um, Sarah Two Holland. Um, on Instagram, uh, Sarah Holland writes, um, and then that, my website is sarahhollandwrites.com. So we're going to send everybody to, uh, to go see you. Uh, thanks yeah. for taking time to come on the show, Sarah. Thank you so, so much for having us. This was fun. Essence, book one, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth, but first he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book 1, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Jason yanked the coils of safety rope to one shoulder and heaved them out the attic window. The bundle bounced over the roof line and dropped to the yard below. He tightened the harness, making sure the shoulder straps were snug over his sweatshirt. He threaded his rope through the braking device, tested it, and clipped everything to the carabiner at his navel. So far, so good. Fireman Mike would be proud. His stomach flipped as he neared the octagonal window. Had he tied the correct knots? Would he get himself killed? Weeks had passed since Mike's tutorial and... But he had to attempt the break-in now, while both Van Brunts were at the Christmas Eve service. He swung his legs through the window and felt for the roof. His sneakers gripped the shingles and he wriggled out, grateful for once to have feet as big as snowshoes. He pulled on a ski mask and sang, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. He lowered his body. Wind punched him in the jaw like a supervillain, surprising him. His sweatshirt rode up and snow burrowed into his navel. 
He looked down but couldn't see his feet. He relaxed his hands and put a few ounces of weight on the rope. Clots of snow broke away, dove over the edge, and took far too long to hit ground. He drew his rope around the pipe and pulled tight. Now he could drop. No, you will not drop. You will repel. You will repel very safely. He backed towards the edge, towards the point of no return. The backyard lurched into view. It was a four-story fall, and he'd probably hit the stairs on the way down. He sledded helplessly. His legs fell, swung, and kicked the side of the house. Alarm bells went off in his head. He gripped the rope. It looked like nothing. A shoelace. Jason Crane, you're a damn fool. He went limp and fell over. The rope gave a jolt, and the harness tried to castrate him. He twisted, trying to save his poor descendants. He began to spin. His arm bashed through a row of icicles. The spin slowed, reversed, and at last he came to a stop with his back to the house, dangling over the backyard. Thank you, rope. That's a good rope. Well done. He tried to turn around, but couldn't. With patience, he worked out a method of kicking in circles and managed to press his sneakers to the side of the house. He needed slack. He gathered his loose rope to the small of his back and disengaged the brake. Zip! He fell fast, all his weight on the rope now. His feet, planted, shot up over his head. The brake caught him, and the rope vibrated as wildly as a guitar string striking a note of panic. Jason heard a crunching sound and looked up. The leaf gutter crumpled and poured a stream of bitter ice water into his eyes. He snarled and wiped his face, dripping humiliation. Jason rested a moment and stared at his reflection in the glass. He was an enormous Macy's balloon drifting over New Jersey, tethered at the navel like underdog. How the hell did you get up here, kid? He did an awkward split, one foot above the window and the other below, hanging sideways with his weight on one hip. He closed his eyes and reached for the sill, crouching against the side of the house. His fingernails found the weather stripping, and he tugged locked. He cursed and tugged again, anger rising. He grabbed the frame with both hands and pulled with all his spider strength. Something popped. The window rose and the curtains splashed out. Jason dove headfirst into the fabric, wriggled and kicked, let out some rope and fell with a wump into his archenemy's lair. <laughs>